you don't want me to tell her we abandoned this? She was very touched that I'd been I'd be digging the grave. Okay. We'll tell her you dug the grave. It's the truth. Stretched but still true. Besides, what would be left of love without truth stretched beyond its limits? Without those better versions of ourselves that we present as the only ones that exist. Combining the political turmoil in Nigeria in the 1980s with the struggles of a married couple who will sacrifice whatever it takes to have a child together, with both perspectives from the husband and the wife, this novel is heartbreaking, inspiring, and beautifully written. So without further ado, please help me welcome Ayobami Adebayo. I'm going to start talking uh, about this book, and I'm going to talk, first of all, about place. Um about the different places that feature prominently in this novel. So um, if you've heard about Nigeria, you've probably heard about Lagos, you know, and um, it's where I was born. And it's both a joy that it's a city that is so well known. And it can sometimes personally for me be annoying because my family left that place shortly before I was born. And anywhere I go, everybody thinks I'm from Lagos. Um, So in a sense, I wanted to write about somewhere outside of Lagos. I was very clear about that. So I'll start with some of the places. Um, the city that pro- features prominently here is Elisha, which is where my family moved to after we left Lagos. We lived there until I was about six, and then we left. The interesting thing is that when I was writing this novel, I wasn't living there, and I hadn't lived there for quite a while. But looking back now, I think writing about that place was probably also an exercise in nostalgia, um, an attempt to recreate a moment that was um, very precious to me and that I remember fondly. Uh, I wasn't very conscious of it, but when I read bits of it again I can see little bits of myself and it's interesting because one of the things that I used to say a lot when before this book was finished was that I was writing a book that wasn't about me at all Um, so I was still writing this book in my early 20s I wasn't married I didn't have any children and it's a lot of it it's about a marriage and so I assumed that it was totally all imagined until I think shortly before it got published, I was reading it, I think, for the last time. And I realized that the house that the couple lives in um, at the beginning of the book was the house I grew up in. I Somehow the geography was exactly the same. Um, yeah, so the subconscious, it it's kind of feeds you in there as It doesn't matter how much you want to stay out of your fiction. You're there somehow. The second city here is a city called Ileife. And it's a university town where we moved after we left the first city. So we moved there and I went to university there. And um, it's also a city that's come to matter to me. It's where I think about when I think of home, even though I've not lived there for a couple of years now. And then the final city, it's kind of my fantasy land. Um, In a perfect world, in a perfect Nigeria, that's where I think I would live. And that's a city called Joss. And that's where the novel begins. Um, There's just one chapter in the novel that's set there. And then we go back uh, south. But it's a city that I'm kind of fond of. But the character... So when at the end of the novel, towards the end of the novel, when the lead character, the lead female character has to go somewhere. I sort of send her there because, you know, it's the dream world for me. Um, So I'm going to read a bit from the beginning that's set in Joss. And um, I think for this bit, what you just need to know is that this is a novel about a marriage and the lead characters are Yejidi Anaki. And here, the wife, she's been away from, they've been separated for uh, over a decade and she's going back um, for his father's funeral. And she's uh, a bit apprehensive about going back for a number of reasons that become obvious later. I must leave the city today and come to you. 
My bags are packed and the empty rooms remind me that I should have left a week ago. Musa, my driver, has slept at the security guard's post every night since last Friday, waiting for me to wake him up at dawn so we can set out on time. But my bags still sit in the living room, gathering dust. I have given most of what I acquired here, furniture, electronic devices, even house fittings to the stylists who worked in my salon. So every night for a week now, I've tossed about on this bed without a television to shorten my insomniac hours. There's a house waiting for me in Ife, right outside the university where you and I first met. I imagine it now, a house not unlike this one. It's many rooms designed to nurture a big family, man, wife, and many children. I was supposed to leave a day after my hairdressers were taken down, after my air dryers were taken down. The plan was to spend a week setting up my new salon and furnishing the house. I wanted my new life in place before seeing you again. It's not that I've become attached to this place. I will not miss the few friends I made, the people who do not know the woman I was before I came here, the men who over the years have thought they were in love with me. Once I leave, I probably won't even remember the one who asked me to be his wife. Nobody here knows I'm still married to you. I only tell them a slice of the story. I was barren and my husband took another wife. No one has ever proved further, so I've never told them about my children. I have wanted to leave since the three youth coppers in the National Youth Service Program were killed. I decided to shut down my salon and the jewelry shop before I even knew what I would do next, before the invitation to your father's funeral arrived like a map to show me the way. I have memorized the three young men's names, and I know what each one studied in the university. My Olamide would have been about their age. She too would just have been leaving university about now. When I read about them, I think of her. Haki, I wonder if you think about her too. Although sleep stays away, every night I shut my eyes and pieces of the life I left behind come back to me. I see the batik pillowcases in our bedroom, our neighbors and your family which for a misguided period, I thought was also mine. I see you. Tonight, I see the bedside lamp you gave me a few weeks after we got married. I could not sleep in the dark, and you had nightmares if we left the fluorescent lights on. That lamp was your solution. You bought it without telling me you'd come up with a compromise, without asking me if I wanted a lamp. And as I struck its bronze base and admired the tinted glass panels that formed its shade, you asked me what I would take out of the building if our house was burning. I didn't think about it before saying, Our baby, even though we did not have children yet. Something, you said, not someone. But you seemed a little hurt that when I thought it was someone, I did not consider rescuing you. All right. Thank you. So that's um, the first bit. And uh, so she's looking back on this marriage that ended about 15 years before the beginning of the novel. And then we go into the marriage. And um, one of the things she mentions here that sort of feeds through the novel and heightens the betrayal that she experiences is that she gets married to him and at some point begins to believe that she's sort of been adopted into his family. She adopts his mother as her own mother. And I think this is particularly because she comes from a polygamous family, as he does. But... She lost her mother when she was very young. Her mother died while giving back to her. And 
in a polygamous family, I think that a mother's position, a mother's role becomes extremely important. She's the child's advocate because they're like four wives and 20 children and one man, you know. So it's the mother who really advocates for our children and makes sure that our children get the resources that they need, get the attention from their father. So to grow up motherless in that kind of setting, it's it can be traumatic. And so she grows up and she meets this man and thinks everything is going to be perfect from there. They get married, his mother loves her, and uh, she believes they're home free. But after a few years, they don't have any children in a culture where having children is extremely important. And then things begin to fall apart at the seams, even though at this point they still love each other. But the expectations that their families have of them and the investments that the families have made um, to require that to have feel that they have a right to have those expectations make things uh, a little bit complicated for them. So um, I'm going to read a bit from later on in the novel. And at this point, uh, it's a bit of a spoiler, but you get it happens right in the second chapter. So it's not quite a spoiler. The husband has taken a second wife. And I think it's there in the first chapter too, actually. Um, the husband has married a second wife, but it has what everybody expects her to be grateful for that he's married a second wife but the second wife is not living in the same house with them you know so she's supposed to be happy because you know he's tried you know at least he's put the second woman in another apartment she doesn't have to see the second woman every day but of course she's not happy about this but she still loves him very much and wants to have a child as soon as possible and she thinks that that's the only way to save a marriage that she gets pregnant before this other woman and then that other marriage becomes invalidated because it's obvious to her and I think to the reader that the husband doesn't care for this woman he just feels that this is his responsibility to his own family too and he's got his own issues so here she is, she's going to visit her mother-in-law. She's found um, a miracle worker of sorts who's going to help her to get pregnant. And her mother-in-law is sort of the person she goes to for advice about these things. I believed I was mommy's favorite daughter-in-law. As a child, it was expected that I would call my stepmothers mommy. Even my father encouraged me to, but I refused. I stuck to calling them mama. And whenever my father was not around, some of the women would slap me just because I refused to honor them by calling them my mother. I did not refuse because I was being stubborn or trying to defy them as a number of them concluded. My mother had become an obsession for me, a religion, and the very thought of referring to another woman as mother seemed sacrilegious, a betrayal of the woman who had given up her life for me to live. One year, the Anglican church my family attended celebrated Mothering Sunday with a special service. After the vicar delivered a sermon, he summoned everyone who was below the age of 18 to the front of the church because he wanted us to honor mothers with a song. I must have been 12 at the time, but I didn't get up until an usher poked me in the back. We sang a song that everyone already knew, an expansion of a popular saying. I managed the first line. <clears throat> Before biting my tongue to choke back tears, the words, mother is gold, mother is treasured gold that cannot be bought with money, resonated with me more than any homily I'd ever had. I knew by then that my mother could not be replaced with money by a stepmother 
or anyone else. And I was sure I would never call any woman mommy. Yet, every time Akin's mother wrapped me in a fleshy embrace, my heart sang, mommy. And when I called out the venerated title, it did not cling to my truth and refuse to climb out the way it used to when my stepmothers tried to slap it out of me. She lived up to the name, taking my side if any issue I had with her son came to her attention, assuring me that it was only a matter of time before I got pregnant, insisting that my miracle would be waiting once I turned the right corner. When Mrs. Adeolu, a pregnant customer, told me about the mountain of jaw-dropping victory, I went to mommy that same day to discuss it with her. I needed her to authenticate the information. She was a treasure house of knowledge about such things. Even if she did not know anything about a miracle house, she usually knew whom to ask. And once she had asked checked out the stories, she was always prepared to accompany me to seek a new solution. There was a time when I would have ignored Mrs. Adeolu's words, a time when I did not believe in prophets who lived on mountains or priests who worshipped beside rivers. That was before I had so many tests done in the hospital, and every one of them showed that there was nothing preventing me from getting pregnant. I hoped at some point that the doctors would find something wrong. Anything to explain why my period still showed up every month, years after my marriage. I wish they would find something they could treat or cut out. They found nothing. Haki also went in to get tested and came back saying that the doctors had found nothing wrong with him. Then... I stopped waving aside my mother-in-law's suggestions, stopped thinking that women like her were uncivilized and a little crazy. I became open to alternatives. If I was not getting what I wanted in one place, what was wrong with searching elsewhere? My parents-in-law lived in Ayeso, an old section of town that still had a few mud houses. Their house was a brick building with a front yard partially enclosed by a low cement fence. When I arrived at the house, Mommy was sitting on a low stool in the front yard, shelling groundnuts into a rusty tray that sat on her lap. She looked up as I approached and looked down again. I swallowed and my steps slowed. There was something wrong. Mommy usually greeted me by shouting, Yet you day, my wife. The words were as warm as the embrace that usually followed them. Good evening, mommy. My knees trembled as they touched the concrete floor. Are you pregnant now? She said, without looking up from the tray of groundnuts. I scratched my head. Are you barren and deaf too? I say, are you pregnant? The answer is either yes, I am pregnant, or no, I still haven't been pregnant for a single day in my life. I don't know. I stood up and backed away until she was not within the reach of my clenched fist. Why won't you allow my son to have a child? She slapped the tree of granite on the floor and stood up. I don't manufacture children. God does. She marched towards me and spoke when her toes were touching the tips of my shoes. Have you ever seen God in a labor ward giving birth to a child? Tell me, Yejide, have you ever seen God in the labor room? Women manufacture children. And if you can't, you're just a man. Nobody should call you a woman. She gripped my wrists and lowered her voice to a whisper. This life is not difficult, Yeji Day. If you cannot have children, allow my son to have some with Fumi. See, we're not asking you to stand up from your place in his life. We're just saying you should shift so that someone else can also sit down. I'm not stopping him, mommy, I said. I've accepted her. She even spends the weekends in our house now. She held her thick waist and laughed. 
I'm a woman too. Do you think I was born last night? Tell me why has Akin never touched for me? He's been married to her for over two months. Tell me why he has not removed her rapper once. Tell me, Yejide. I stifled a smile. It's not my business what Akin does with his wife. Mommy lifted my blouse and laid a wrinkled palm on my stomach. <laughs> Flat as the side of a wall, she said. You've had my son between your legs for two more months and still your stomach is flat. Close your thighs to him, I beg you. We all know how he feels about you. If you don't chase him away, he won't touch for me. If you don't, he will die childless. I beg you, don't spoil my life. He's my first son, Yejide. I beg you in the name of God. I closed my eyes. But tears still forced their way past my eyelids. Mommy sighed. I have been good to you. I beg you in the name of God, Yejide, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. She held me then, pulled me into her arms and muttered words of comfort. Her embrace held no warmth. Her words sat in my stomach, cold and hard where her baby should have been thank you um so <laughs> yeah there's a lot to unpack there um so this is our mother-in-law and it's interesting that the song in that um excerpt mother is gold it's a very famous saying um among the yoruba and there are a lot of things like that about a mother's position and how important mothers are. And it's all wonderful. It's all good. Until you really think about how complex that conception is. Because in many ways, um, womanhood is sort of conflated with motherhood. So that the idea that she exists as a woman and she cannot have children sort of negates a position as a woman. And that's a, in the, when you really think about it in that culture, a position as a member of the society. Um, so that on one hand, it is this venerated position, but it's, it's not that simple. It's um, beneficial when your life sort of feeds what is expected of you um if it doesn't for any reason i think that many women quickly realize that any respect any position that any regard that they're given in the community is contingent on this ability to procreate and one of the things that i think happens as a result of thinking about this subject like that is that the woman's body then, in a sense, is, is not necessarily seen as her own. It, it, it's like this communal property, this vessel, which is why the mother-in-law feels that she has a right to just put her hand on her stomach like that, you know, without... Because this, you, it's basically a receptacle um, when you really analyze it down to what the implication is. So, but for this character in particular, this is something she wants. She really wants to have children. And um, I think that when a husband marries a second wife, she wants to have children more than she did before. And not for one, I mean, she wants to save a marriage. But I think apart from that, is that she realizes and I think that this particular encounter crystallizes that realization for her. That she realizes that there's a permanence in the relationship between a mother and a child that she doesn't have in her life. The sort of permanent relationships in her life has been, has been the relationship she's had with her husband. That's like being the most stable relationship she's had all her life. And the fact that he could then become somebody else's husband causes her to realize that it's um it's a mutable situation and i think that on the subconscious level she begins to think to herself if i have a child then i will always have somebody in my life who belongs to me 
So in some ways, this book is also about possession and how sometimes familial relationships can be transactional. Um, that what we like to, what should be unconditional love can be conditional. Um, you're my child, you go to school, you behave and therefore I love you. Um, it works well when that child is perfect. When that child, some for some reason, is not whatever the parent wants, then I think it's sometimes when we really test what the relationship is. So that the mother-in-law here looks at her son and thinks, you need to have children, and does everything to make sure that he has children. What she she doesn't really consider is the possibility that that child is happier um, making their own decisions. I'm going to read two more excerpts and um, this is a little bit darker. <laughs> um, so it's later on. Um, so she has a child and this is a scene where um, Something happens with the first child. And then I'm going to read something from the husband's perspective. Um, and we'll take questions, I think. Her mother must be vigilant. She must be able and willing to wake up 10 times during the night to feed her baby. After her intermittent vigil, she must see everything clearly the next day so that she can notice any changes in her baby. A mother is not permitted to have blurry vision. She must notice if her baby's will is too loud or too low. She must know if the baby's temperature has risen or fallen. A mother must not miss any signs. I'm still sure that I missed important signs. I had decided as soon as she was born that I would breastfeed Olamide for at least one year. I still had a long way to go on the morning that I missed the important signs. She was just five months old. I was feeling sleepy that morning because I had to wake up several times during the night to feed her. At dawn, I showered, gave Olamide a bath, rocked her to sleep and laid her in the cot. Then I climbed into bed to get a few hours of sleep fully expecting her to wake me up with her wills within a few hours. I woke up around half past noon and was relieved that Olamide was still sleeping in her cot. I went downstairs to get some food. I must have spent about 30 minutes in the kitchen. After I finished eating, I went back upstairs expecting to find my daughter awake. She did not always cry when she woke up. Sometimes she would stay in the cot, gurgling, and amusing herself. When I leaned over her cot, Olamide seemed unusually still. It took me about a moment to re realize that she was not breathing. I picked her up and screamed her name. I shook her and tried to check her heartbeat. I ran downstairs with my baby in my arms, still screaming. I rushed about the sitting room trying to find my car keys. I probably spent a few minutes searching for the keys but it felt like a year. When I checked every surface and kicked the cushions out of the, sof out of the chair, I stood in the middle of the room for a brief moment, holding my limp baby close to my breast. I remember picking up the phone and calling Akin's office. I know that I spoke with him, but I do not remember what I said. I remember dropping the phone and leaving the house, running out of the estate into the street, where I flagged down the taxi that took me to the hospital. So now I'm going to read something from the husband's perspective. And one of the ways that I think about this novel, or one of the things that I thought about when I was writing it, was that um, I thought of it as a conversation between two people, between two people who had been married at a point and uh, became separated. And after over a decade, I'm meeting again for the first time. And as they're sort of approaching the meeting, they're both looking back on the marriage and trying, on one hand, to figure out 
what they missed that made the marriage fail. On the other hand, to explain and justify uh, some of the choices and decisions that they made. So the chapter I'm going to read from the husband's perspective is um, he's preparing for his father's funeral. He sent this invitation to um, his estranged wife. She sort of disappeared for a few years and then he found her and sent her the invitation to this event. He doesn't know yet if she's going to show up because she hasn't um, gotten back to him. But he's standing here with his brother, with his brother-in-law, um, preparing for their f for his own father's funeral, and um, sort of thinking about his marriage and trying to explain things to himself, and kind of talking to her in his head. I'm digging my father's grave, doing more than I should because my sister's husband overestimated his abilities when he promised to do it. As my father's first son, I'm supposed to shovel the first and last clumps of sand out of the grave for safekeeping. My father's son-in-law is supposed to do the rest or pay someone to. I thought Henry would pay laborers to do this since that's what most people do these days. Yejide, you must remember how I told you years ago that this tradition would soon die out. It was after your father died, while your family made arrangements for the funeral, you told them that I should join in the grave digging, even though we were not yet married. Of course, your stepmothers wouldn't allow it. And you wept under the whites of your high stand pink. I tried to comfort you, told you that it didn't really matter because everyone would be hiring laborers to dig graves in a few years anyway. I'm not sure you heard me or cared. You cried yourself to sleep that night. I couldn't tell you at the time, but I was relieved I didn't have to dig your father's grave. I believed in ghosts then was terrified of graveyards. Yet, if your stepmothers had agreed to let me dig, I would have done it to please you. You must know that. No matter what you think of me now, there are few things I wouldn't do to make you happy. I'm certain now that there are no ghosts, because if there were, I would be haunted already. So here I am, about two feet deep, helping Henry out so that the work will be done by the time we leave for the week. Henry's doing this to prove a point to my parents. For three years, my parents insisted they were not giving their only daughter in marriage to Henry because he's not Yoruba. They stood by their word until my sister ended the argument by getting pregnant. Then the people who had sworn that they would be dead before he married their daughter invited Henry to pick any date for the wedding so that it would be done before the pregnancy started showing. Henry now speaks Yoruba fluently, knows more about our traditions than I do. And here we are, slaving silently beneath a blazing sun because Henry is still trying to prove to my parents that he is good enough for their daughter. It's obvious now from his heavy breathing that he'd stretched out the truth to the breaking point when he claimed he could do this the way it should be done. The sun is so hot. Feels like there's a furnace on my back. My arms ache each time I lift the shovel, but I keep going. I think about Dotto as I shovel. Miss him for the first time in all these years. If he were here, he would have broken the silence, found a way to make Henry and me laugh. He called me this morning around seven. He didn't introduce himself. He didn't have to. Once he said, Brother King, good morning. I recognized his voice. He said he was calling from the airport hotel. I'd received the letter I had sent him about the funeral arrangements and would be leaving Lagos by noon to get to Elisha in time for the week. Our first conversation in over a decade lasted less than a minute. When I got off the phone, I felt none of the hunger I'd expected to feel. Instead, I had a sudden desire to stay in bed and sp spend the day sleeping. Dutton's phone call made me ask myself, 
if you'll honor my invitation. I wonder if you'll show up at the wake, if you'll agree to sit beside me and sing hymns. This ground is getting harder as we dig deeper. It doesn't look like a grave. It's just a hole in the ground. I clear my throat. I think we should call someone to finish this thing. Henry smiles and collapses against the grave's wall. It's as if he's been waiting all day for me to say this. He frowns. Henry, I wait for him to finish his sentence, but he says nothing. I watched I watch his furrowed brow, trying to understand what his silence means. You don't want me to tell her we abandoned this? She was very touched that I'd been I'd be digging the grave. Okay. We'll tell her you dug the grave. It's the truth. Stretched but still true. Besides, what will be left of love? without truth stretch beyond its limits, without those better versions of ourselves that we present as the only ones that exist. Thank you so much for listening. Contributions, comments, somebody wants to sing. <laughs> so you, you know, since you, you wrote the book when you had not, you were not married, you don't have children, didn't didn't have children, so you drew on your ex your personal experience being raised in Nigeria. So, do you feel like writing the book altered in any way, transformed your attitude towards marriage and children? And do you, are you married with children now? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think um, I think it helped me to sort of clarify some of the thoughts I had had before. Um, and yes, definitely. I think I think it altered the way I thought about it. Um, one of the things that I came away with was it sort of reflected in one in the chapter I read where she talks about, you know, a mother must do this and do that. And it, it was really writing it and thinking about what an awesome responsibility it it is to um, decide to bring somebody else into this world and. Uh, be their primary caregiver, um, as is the case in most um, circumstances. So yes, um, that was one thing that it, it kind of made me more nervous about the idea uh, than I was before. I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but we'll see. Yeah. And was it well received in Nigeria? Um, yeah, I th I think so. Um, I I I feel like I mean I've been very astonished by the way it's been received, uh, particularly in Nigeria. That where sometimes I do events and people tell me personal stories and some of the experiences they've had, some of the discussions they've had with their own mothers after reading this book or giving it to their mom to read. Um, some of them got to know about siblings they never knew they had um, who had passed on, maybe before they were born. Um, and they've never been told about. So yeah, it's mostly, I think, been well received. The book is described as a book, as a, one of the themes in the book, as infertility. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as I read it and our book club read it, it mm -hmm. seemed to us that it, it had more to do with male impotence mm -hmm. than infertility. Mm -hmm. And that that's not usually defined in this country mm -hmm. as infertility so mm -hmm. to speak mm -hmm. and yet she still took on all the responsibility mm -hmm. for not conceiving and having a baby and I just wonder sort of it was no whether there's no conflict of that around that because of the culture or mm -hmm. what yeah um, I mean it's a very specific story um, I think there are a lot of ways that it could have played out um, if she had had a mother, it would be a different novel. Totally different novel. Um, because, um, I mean, as you see with his own mother, she's very involved in their lives. And her own mother would probably have been involved in their lives. And she would have been the one to look out for her daughter's interest. So I think one of the things that plays out 
here in terms of culture is that the extended family is, is a very strong network. And if you come into a marriage without your own people, um, you, you can't, I mean, if the marriage goes well, you might not notice. But when there are conflict points, there's, there's, that, um, there's the tendency for uh, whoever that is to sort of bear um, the brunt of whatever goes wrong in the marriage. Yeah. Yes. Have you had time to start working on a second novel? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I have. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see it too. Really. <laughs> Do you, I guess, another question mm. I would have since you do events in Nigeria, you mm. do events in the U.S., I assume you do them in other countries as well. Mm. Have you seen differences in people's reactions mm. or receptions to the book? It's interesting, but no. <laughs> um, I mean, there might be uh, like a silver, but it's not as as um, it's not as um, the differences are not as pronounced that I, as I thought they would be. Because like I said, it's a very specific, uh, it's about a specific place. And I think it, it sort of came to the most sort of shocking moment in relation to that was, I was in Sweden last year, the translation came out. And I was in Sweden for an event. And there was a woman who came up to me and said, you know, this woman reminds me of my mother-in-law. And I thought, really? <laughs> And I honestly thought, I, that's what I was thinking, really? <laughs> she made it all the way over here from Nigeria. So yeah, it's, 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 it's I, I don't know. It, it just seems to, even when it's in another language, it seems to find, yeah, I think people some, some recognize something um, about their lives in it. So it's, um, I haven't read the book. So the, the, the main home is in Lagos. The couple's home is in Lagos. Mm -hmm. It's in a city called Elisha. Oh, it's in Elisha, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So, but this, these are, um, Ife and Elisha are very historic cities. So mm -hmm. how does Lagos figure in the book? Because Lagos mm -hmm. is a very different, I mean, Lagos is historic also, mm -hmm. but it doesn't carry that sort of mythical and mm -hmm. religious importance, right? Yeah. So, um, and it's become very different from any other city, mm -hmm. almost on the continent, except yeah. maybe Nairobi or mm -hmm. um, Johannesburg. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do these three ci these kind of mythic places, these th three cities, figure in the mm. mythology of family mm. life? Mm. So, um, so the two cities where this this novel happens, there's Ilefe, which you're familiar with, is a university town, and that's where they meet. So um, she's in the university when they meet. Um, he meets her there. They leave. He's already working in Elisha, which is just about thirty minutes drive. It's it's very close. It's less than thirty minutes drive actually. Um, Lagos is about three hours um, from these two cities, and um, it figures as um, sort of an outpost. It's where his brother lives. And he goes to visit his brother a couple of times and he goes there for business. So it, it, I think it figures the way Lagos is for Nigerians who don't live in Lagos, how it can sort of be a center, in a commercial center, um, a, an economic capital of sorts, and uh, how you always have people in Lagos, um, particularly if you're from the Southwest. Um, you're, you, there's, it's, it, that it, it, it has a draw. Even when people are not there, there's a way things tend, it tends to draw people and things to itself and circumstances, uh, sort of like, I would say maybe the climax of the novel kind of happens there. Um, yeah. But I mean, the interesting thing that I wanted to say about that is that Yoruba is a tonal language. So I think that, I mean, it, I, I'm partial to it because it's my first language and I really love it. But I think it really lent itself to music and poetry um, in, in the, because there's an internal rhythm to it. So do you include, you know, lamentation? Or, I mean, in the creative expression, do you include 
musicality or ritual mm. or lamentation. I mean, if she's going through this, you know, I, I read some of the synopses on the web that she actually mm. has a false pregnancy and then she mm. has a real pregnancy or not. She does, <laughs> but the child is... Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a very complicated sort of, you know, yeah. world yeah, that she has. So, you know, I mean, does, mm. it, does that yeah. do include, you know, there are many rituals mm. around mm. Um, fertility mm. and the symbolism mm. and music and lamentation. Mm. Um, um, two things that feature... I mean, so she does this weird thing where she goes up a mountain. Um sort of uh that has nothing to do with any real thing no yeah that that's just some hocus pocus um and then there is i think the other thing that i sort of take from the culture there are two stories in this book um one that she tells a child um about a woman who also wanted to have a ch have children and then lost one of those children, um, that child. On, I mean, the story's there. And then the second story is one that he tells the child about a couple who are trying to have children. And I think like those stories um, are sort of metaphors for where they brought her. And my interest in choosing the stories was also to kind of think about storytelling and how um it's it's not an innocent act um really when you really examine it um people choose to tell certain stories for different reasons and for the two of them that choice uh, was informed by their perception, where they were, what they were trying to accomplish, and also the fact that they're still sort of talking back to each other and trying to work through um, the things that broke down their marriage. So yeah, th that was a definite thing that came from um, the culture. And I, it, w it was interesting to for me that those were things that really already existed um, in the traditional narratives. So I think it's sort of showed me that I mean I wasn't the first person to really think about these things you know that um, yeah thank you so very much mm -hmm.